Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Planetarium Exploring Space, part of our MOS at Home pro pro programming. My name is Janine. My pronouns are she and her, and I'll be your moderator today. That means that I'll be reading some of your questions and responses, which you can submit below using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen here in the Zoom meeting. If you'd like to see captions during today's program, you can click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. And if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, welcome. We're so delighted to have you here. Unfortunately, I'm unable to see anything that you write over there, um, but thank you for joining us anyway. We're so delighted to have all of you here today as our audience. Let's meet our flight crew for today's journey. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and today I will be your educator as we uh, talk about Mars. Hello, everybody. My name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns as well, and I am going to be your pilot today. Awesome. Uh, so I hope everybody enjoyed that introductory video. Um, that was a NASA video, um, a NASA animation made specifically for the landing of the Perseverance Mars rover that will be landing on Mars on February 18th of this month. Um, so all of our exploring space shows this month are going to be dedicated to Mars. Um, today we're going to be talking a lot about Mars as it is today and how how it has changed over billions of years. Um, so I thought we would open with Perseverance uh, to look at that wonderful landing and just talk a little bit about the goals of Perseverance and how that relates to um, changing Mars and also sending humans to Mars eventually someday. So right now we are looking, Talia has brought us to um, the Perseverance rover using a program called NASA's Eyes. Um, and it shows this spacecraft in real time on its way to Mars. So this is what it looks like. The rover is kind of contained in there. Um, and as you saw in, in that opening video, um, it's got several stages of descent with a parachute as well as that sky crane that's going to get it safely to the surface. Now its um, projected landing site is Jezero Crater. And the reason that scientists chose this site in particular is because it's thought to have been uh, the site of an ancient lake. So there could be um, minerals and other potential biosignatures that Perseverance is going to look for that might indicate that there maybe was life on Mars in the past. Currently, we don't have any evidence for life existing in the past or presently on Mars. And so that is one of the many goals of Perseverance is to look and see if there, it can find any kind of evidence for life on Mars. Um, so to open things up um, and to ask you a question, you can type in your answers into the Q&A. But just based on what you already know about Mars, maybe you know a lot, maybe you don't know much at all. Um, but just based on what you already know, um, why don't you go ahead and tell me if you think that Mars is a hospitable place for life today. So if you think that life could survive on the surface of Mars today. All right, we're having a couple answers come in and they say no. No, was that, sorry. I yeah, it no, second. it cannot. I don't think so. No, it's not hospitable. Yeah, Mars is a pretty extreme place. Um, so why don't we go ahead and switch gears and visit the planet? All right, so here we are still using NASA's eyes, which is pretty cool. It shows you all the spacecraft as well as a tour of the solar system. And it's a free program if you wanna um, use it. We'll have the link for you at the end of the show. Um, so let's just talk about 
some basic facts about Mars. Um, it is the fourth planet from the sun. So we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then Mars. Um, it's about 150 million miles away from the sun and Earth is about 93 million miles away. So when they are on the same side of the solar system lined up, they are roughly 50 to 60 million miles apart, but that's at the closest point. Um, most of the time they're much farther apart than that. And so when we send spacecraft to Mars, we tend to send it when it's going to minimize the amount of time it takes to get there. So for Perseverance, it launched back in late July. And so it's going to be, once it lands, it'll be about a seven month trip. And if we ever send humans to Mars, we're going to want to keep that trip as short as possible. So it's a much longer journey than sending anything to the moon, which by comparison only takes about three days. So it's, it's farther away. Um, it's also smaller than the Earth. It's about a little over half the size of the Earth, which also means that its gravity is less. Its force of gravity is about a third of the Earth's. So if you were on the surface, um, you definitely feel lighter, bouncier um, on the surface. And we also have a nickname for Mars that we like to call it. So if anybody knows what nickname I'm talking about, you can go ahead and type that into the Q&A. And to give you a hint, it has to do with what it looks like, both if you look at it in the night sky or if you're looking at it up close like we are right now. We have a bunch of people who are saying the red planet. Yes, that's correct. Um, I'm sure there are other nicknames out there as well, but the red planet is what I was thinking of. And as you can see, we're up close now. It does have a reddish hue. It's kind of more of a burnt orangey color. But this has to do with what is in the soil on Mars. So Mars is pretty dry. It's full of rock and dust. And in the soil on Mars, or the, the kind of dusty, rocky ground, um, there's a lot of iron. And when you expose iron to oxygen, uh, you get rust. And so there's a teensy tiny bit of oxygen in the Martian atmosphere. And when this iron in the soil is exposed to it, um, it rusts. So Mars is essentially covered in rust, which gives it its beautiful color. But let's talk more about its atmosphere. Um, it's much thinner than Earth's atmosphere. It's about, I believe 1% as thick as Earth's, and it's mo made mostly of carbon dioxide, which is poisonous to humans if we were to breathe it in. Um, so the Martian atmosphere, not super hospitable, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't work for humans uh, to just be breathing it in. And it's also very, very thin, which contributes to the overall cold temperatures on Mars. So Mars is farther away from the sun, which definitely contributes to the fact that Mars is so cold. Um, but if you actually look at our whole solar system, Venus and Mars and the Earth are all technically in the habitable zone of our sun. It's just that they aren't habitable because of their atmospheres. Venus has an incredibly thick atmosphere that traps in way too much heat, making it the hottest planet in the solar system. Whereas Mars kind of has the opposite problem. It's got a very thin atmosphere, doesn't trap in much heat at all. Therefore, it gets very cold. If you go toward the poles of Mars, it actually can get to like negative 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, some other places uh, are generally like negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a very cold place. In the summertime on Mars, um, some places on the surface can actually, like in the equatorial regions, they can get fairly warm, like 70 degrees, I think is one of the um, highest temperatures recorded on Mars. So temperatures vary quite a bit. And, and most of that is because of the fact that it has such a thin atmosphere. But because we've sent so many orbiters and rovers to Mars, we've sent four official rovers that have uh, successfully landed on the surface of Mars. Plus we've got Perseverance on the way and many, many orbiters. And they've all been studying Mars for a very long time and have been able to tell us that Mars has changed quite a bit over billions of years. Part of that is 
uh, evidence of past water on Mars, as I mentioned at the beginning. That's why Perseverance is going to Jezero Crater, because it's thought to be an area where there was once a lake. There's also a bunch of river uh, deltas kind of feeding into the crater that were carved out by water. Some of um, this really major surface features on Mars are made by water as well. So there's one gash across the surface of Mars that scientists um, believe was formed from water. This is Vallis Marineris. It's a massive canyon stretching uh, thousands of miles across. So if you were to compare it to the Earth, it would actually stretch um, or if you compare it to the United States, it would stretch from New York City all the way to San Francisco on the other side. So compared to the Grand Canyon, um, this is a monstrosity. It's also five times as deep as the Grand Canyon. And we see features like this across uh, Mars' surface. And not just stuff caused by water, but also there's evidence for geological activity in the Martian past. So over in this part, um, we can see there are mountains on the surface of Mars that are actually volcanoes. They're ancient um, extinct volcanoes. And it's got the most massive mountain slash volcano in the entire solar system known as Olympus Mons. And for this one, if you were to uh, compare it to the tallest mountain on the Earth, Mount Everest, you'd have to stack two to three Mount Everests on top of each other in order to um, reach the same height as Olympus Mons. So even though Mars is a fairly small planet, um, it's got some of the most impressive uh, features in the entire solar system. All right, so let's go back to water. Um, is there water on Mars today? We talked about water in the past, and we're going to go more into that in just a minute. But tell me if you think that there's Mars, or <laughs> if there's water on Mars today, and what form it might be in if you do think there's water. Well, we've got lots of answers coming in. Some yeses, some no. Some say maybe underneath the surface. Some say ice or ice mist. Maybe there's a little bit. Yeah, those are all great answers. Um, and they're all correct. Uh, it depends on what you mean exactly by water. If you think I'm talking just liquid water, then it's definitely very difficult to find on Mars. Um, if we're talking about ice or solid water, then that's pretty prominent across the entire planet. So Talia is giving us quite a hint here. Um, we can see the Martian poles have our polar ice caps. Um, one of them is made completely of water ice. The other one, the South Pole, is made of um, carbon dioxide ice, also known as dry ice. And astronomers believe that there is actually, well, there's evidence to suggest that there are massive lakes of liquid water on Mars today. They're just underground, underneath um, that South Pole. We also see water ice in the soil on Mars. Um, and we also, sometimes in the summer, um, there are certain edges of craters where we can see very small areas of flowing water, very, very salty water um, that was discovered by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that uses a spectrometer in order to um, figure out the elemental composition of Mars. And so if, there, if you're asking, well, is there liquid water on the surface of the Mars, the answer is a little bit and sometimes, um, but it is mostly very vastly dry. Um, all right, so let's take a trip back in time now and look at what Mars may have looked like billions of years ago. So we're gonna look at another video now from NASA. This is an animation of Mars four billion years ago. So right off the bat, you can see it kind of looks a lot like Earth. We've got lots of water, liquid water, big bodies of water on the surface, lakes, oceans, rivers. We can also look to the atmosphere there. You see clouds, um, a blue sky. If you've ever seen pictures from any of the rovers that have 
we've sent to Mars already, we see uh, a very red sky. And then as it approaches sunset, we can see it change to like a weird dark bluish looking color. Um, that's because the Martian atmosphere is not as thick as it once was. And it's made of, again, carbon dioxide. And so now we're kind of slowly transitioning to present day. You can see the water is gone. It looks very dusty, very rocky. And you can see the sky has changed quite a bit as well. So then that kind of brings us to the question, well, what happened to Mars? And how do we know? So uh, one of the orbiters of Mars, MAVEN, studies the Martian atmosphere. And it has logged that the Martian atmosphere is dwindling away. And it has been dwindling for quite a while now. So it's getting thinner over time because of radiation from the sun. So if you're asking, well, why doesn't that happen to Earth? Well, Earth's atmosphere is protected by a magnetic field, which Mars does not have. It is thought that in the past, Mars may have had a magnetic field, um, but doesn't anymore. So in order to kind of explore this further, we have to look inside of Mars. And I'm going to compare it to Earth's real quick. So what you're looking at is a diagram of the internal structure of the Earth. So right at the top there is the crust, uh, which is a few miles deep. And then underneath that, um, where you see the, the arrows, that kind of orange layer in there, that's the mantle. So that's filled with molten rock. And then below that, the two yellow regions are the Earth's core, the inner and outer core. And the core is incredibly hot. And so that heat heats up the material in the mantle and hot material rises. And then as it cools, it gets denser, so it sinks. And so you get this cycle called convection of basically really hot material moving up, this molten rock moving up, a lot of it's iron. Um, and then cooling and then sinking back down. And this motion is what causes, um, or part of what causes the Earth to have a magnetic field. It's basically the, the um, internal flowing of liquid metal. Now Mars, on the other hand, uh, is believed to have a similar core to the Earth. So molten iron and nickel, it's just that it's not moving. And the moving is very essential to having a magnetic field. Um, so there's no convection happening inside of Mars. And scientists believe that that's because Mars is small. So it cooled faster than the Earth. Um, so there's no magnetic field, but there probably was in the ancient past. And so nothing to protect the Martian atmosphere. So it may have been very thick in the past um, and now it has been stripped away by solar radiation. And with that, we talked about atmospheres kind of trapping in heat. They're like blankets, right? Um, so Mars has a very thin blanket now, but it once had a much thicker one. Um, and so now Mars is a lot colder than it once was back when it had a very thick atmosphere. And as temperatures decrease, that means water freezes a lot of the time. So that's why we see a lot of frozen water on the surface of Mars. But all of those lakes and rivers and oceans, most of that water was lost to space. Because again, without an atmosphere, there's nothing to keep that water liquid. It either freezes or evaporates. Um, and so those are some of the main changes uh, to Mars over, you know, billions of years. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about different um, spacecraft that we've sent to Mars and just give you more information on how we know a lot of this stuff. So I mentioned the MAVEN orbiter, orbiter that has taken um, data about the Martian atmosphere. That's how we know a lot about how it's changed. And we've also sent the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, so that spacecraft has a spectrometer. They all have spectrometers on board, so they're able to um, study the light from Mars, and they're able to look at different surface features and figure out what things are made of, essentially. 
And if you're wondering, like, how do we know what the internal structure of Mars is like? A lot of that comes from volcanoes and looking at the rocks, so a lot of geology going on there. And there are also meteorites from Mars that are on Earth. So in the early solar system, it was a pretty chaotic place. Um, you've got asteroids colliding with planets, um, Mars, plenty, there's plenty of craters on Mars. So a lot of the times those impacts create debris that flies out into space and some of it has actually managed its way to the Earth. And so by looking at these rocks, a lot of them are, are um, formed from Martian volcanoes, we can see into the internal structure of Mars. Something else that's really exciting um, that was fairly recent is the InSight lander. So there are four rovers on Mars, the Sojourner, Spirit Opportunity, and Curiosity, but there's also a lander. So this one is just a stationary um, craft on the surface of Mars called InSight. And this lander is studying um, the internal structure of Mars. And part of its job is to um, look for seismic waves. So earthquakes. And I guess in this case, they'd be called Mars quakes, right? And Mars's crust is very different from the Earth's. It's not broken up into plates. Because on Earth, we get volcanoes and earthquakes because plates are moving together. Mars doesn't have these different plates. The crust is one piece. And so Mars quakes are very rare, but it turns out that InSight was actually able to measure some minor seismic activity, probably coming from the mantle of Mars cooling um, over time and causing these quakes. And so these waves, these seismic waves can tell us a lot about the internal structure of Mars as well. All right. Um, so that's a lot of material. And so I'm going to leave a little extra time for questions, more time than maybe I normally leave because I talk so much. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Max who's wondering if the red sky that we saw in the video is from sulfur. Ah, so uh, Mars is, so its atmosphere is, is mostly carbon dioxide, um, but it's also very dusty. So the material, like the soil, the rock, very dusty. So it gets kind of kicked up by the Martian atmosphere. Um, that's why there's like dust storms and things like that on Mars. And so that kind of skews the atmosphere a little bit to make it look red. So it's essentially the same reason why the soil is red. It's, it's rusty and then that soil gets kicked around everywhere. And so the sky appears red as well. Um, we have a suggestion from Riley who thinks that maybe they could make a rover that could make a very large hole to check if there's water under the surface. That is a really good suggestion. And there was an instrument on the InSight lander. Um, I don't remember its official name, but it was called the Mole because its job was to drill down into the surface of Mars. But unfortunately, it when it was drilling, it got stuck on like a rock or something like that. And they were trying to, you know, remotely fix the situation by getting it out um, or getting it unstuck. But I don't think that was successful. Um, so I think they just had to retire the instrument. Talia, is that, does that sound right? That was fairly recent. They did give up recently on the mole. The mole, it turns out it got caught against a rock. The soil was very different from what they were expecting it to be at the landing site. They tried a lot of stuff, including hammering on it with the robotic arm, which is, a, you know, not what that robotic arm was designed to do. Um, and none of it really worked. They tried for over a year to get that thing to start drilling again, but they've recently given up on it. It's pretty sad. Um, but hopefully they do something like that uh, in the future with other other rovers or landers. So you have a great idea. NASA scientists thought of it as well. We have a couple questions about if we could live on Mars or how long it would be before we could live on Mars. Yeah, so um, we before we want to even have people living on Mars, we just need to see if we can get humans there first. And throughout the program today, I'm sure that you've noticed um, there's a lot 
of things that human, a lot of challenges that humans would have to overcome to just get there in general. Um, like it takes a really long time to get there. There's no atmosphere. So they would have to bring a lot of oxygen with them um, in order to breathe and also to get back to the earth because you need oxygen for rocket fuel. So if they want to come home, they're going to need a lot of oxygen. Um, there, Mars is also not protected from radiation, right? So they're going to have to figure out how to protect humans um, from all of that radiation from the sun, which might mean, you know, sending humans to a, a place that has caves or a place where they could go underground to try to help shield them from that radiation. So there are plans to send humans to Mars in, you know, the next decade or two, probably in at least at least a decade away. Um, but there's a lot of work being done to uh, overcome these challenges and to solve all these different problems, new technologies being developed, rockets, um, even on Perseverance, there is an instrument called MOXIE that is going to utilize the Martian atmosphere and try to split apart the carbon dioxide so that because carbon dioxide is carbon and oxygen or two molecules of oxygen. Um, and so it's going to try to split that up to harvest oxygen, essentially. And so there's all these really innovative um, technologies and different engineering designs that scientists are working on to, to solve these problems. So I would say it's going to be a really long time before humans are able to actually live there for a long period of time. Um, but just seeing humans getting there might happen in, you know, 10 to 20 years. All right, I think we're coming up on three o'clock. So we'll have you guys say goodbye and I'll say hello. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful questions and observations. Happy Mars month. Bye everybody. We'll see you next week for more Mars content. We'll talk a little bit more about how we're exploring Mars. All right, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we hope you learned something. I'm sorry to all of those of you who I was not able to answer your questions. There were many, many, many of you here today. We're so glad of that, but unfortunately it meant we couldn't get to everybody's questions. But as Talia just said, we are having more Mars content coming up um, every Tuesday. So keep your eye out this Mars month of February. Um, if you enjoyed this programming and would like to see more content like this, please go to um, www.mos.org slash MOS at home. You can also follow us on our social media channels. And if you enjoyed today's presentation and would like to support programming like this, please visit engage.mos.org slash welcome to support MOS at home. Today's program was produced using the free software, which several of you were asking about NASA's eyes. Um, you can find that at eyes.nasa.gov. We look forward to seeing you next time.